Welcome to the Win Make Give podcast. Once again, Chad Himes here with Bob Stewart there. Bob, how are you doing today? You already asked me that once. Did you ask me that today already? Well, I asked you that because we recorded an episode. Oh, oh, this is is the second episode. From each other. I'm I'm doing way better than I was an hour ago when you asked me the first time. Okay, good. You are so (laughs) bad at this faking thing. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I spent an hour with you. Like, of course, I'm better than I was an hour ago when you asked me the first time. Bob Stewart, I love it. All right. So we sit here, we come up with these episodes. Sometimes they're obvious, right? Sometimes something is happening in the world and we're like, that's the topic. Sometimes you and I are in a position where something occurs to one of us. We're like, that's what we really want to share. Sometimes our audience says, hey, can you guys do an episode on? So folks, come into our Facebook group. It's facebook.com slash group slash win, make, give, or just search win, make, give. Feel free to say, I'd love if you guys talked about blank. We'd be happy to talk about it uh, if we haven't already. And heck, even if we have, we'll probably talk about it again. Bob, this one, you were just telling me when I said to you, what inspired this one? Sounds to me like it's just a kid of the 80s versus a kid of the 20s. Maybe. Right? Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> So, I mean, I just saw a meme the other day, right, about, you know, you were a kid of the 80s, if this is you, and there was like a bicycle laying down, no bike helmet, the streetlights had come on, and, you know, the kid had run home, right? You just left your bike wherever, you got yourself in the hat, right? We didn't wear bike helmets, don't don't tell your kids that, right? Or seatbelts. Or- <laughs> seatbelts was mom's arm shooting out in front of you, right? None of that stuff mattered in the 80s, and we're all still here somehow, uh, yeah, kids of the 20s, Bob, or, or the, the aughts or the teens here now, um, they're a lot softer. I don't know. I, so you asked me, you said, what, what spur, I, I volunteered at my son's school recently. He's yep. a kindergartner. And I just I spent about half of the day there just taking in the scenery. And I was, you know, went out to recess with them. And, they're soft. Yeah. It, like, yeah. Like there was this, when you were asking me earlier, like, like I was just kind of running through my head some of the different scenarios I saw. And th- there was one scenario where uh, a kid, he was, he was probably in kindergarten. So I think like when they're out of recess, it's kindergarten as a first grader. So he would have been either, you know, five or six, maybe seven years old. And he was up on the monkey bars and like two kids had gone or the, you know, the ones where you like swing the, the next one to the next monkey one bars. to the next one. Yeah, You're monkey right. bars. Okay. So um, one kid had gone. Second kid had gone. Third kid got up there, wanted to go, was kind of scared. And the, the, the recess lady like came over and helped this child along the way. And I just, I thought, look, and, and I'm sure, Chad, when we, the, the, there was some nice recess lady that would have helped you along in the 80s. But no, there wasn't. Just, the teachers were over having a cigarette, leaning against the wall, <laughs> making sure nobody died until we had to go back in. It just made me think like, <laughs> that child over his life is is not going to do many hard things and it's going right. to like what happens when we don't do hard things and fail Absolutely. right and like you know we're we're not keeping score in the little league and look and, and you know I, at some point you get to a place in life i can remember like my grandpa being this guy and i'm now maybe my grandpa where you're just like oh these kids are soft right but I don't know, like, I, and I worry about it for my own kids because when they get out in the world, there's nobody's going to be standing there to, to help you across the monkey bars. You know, no. you're going to have to gone across the monkey bars, fallen, scraped your knee, got back up, decided, all right, how am I going to attack these stupid monkey bars? Right, watched a few people do it, tried again, fell again. Like, I, I think the the things that we can learn from trying hard things and failing at them are are valuable lessons. And I worry about, I worry about my kids. Okay. So this episode is for your kids, right? It's for you. Yet most likely many of you are older to remember being tougher, right? And, and, and you've got kids that are soft. Yeah. I'm calling them that, (laughs) right? Maybe some of you are a little soft when it comes to it. Bob, when it comes to the monkey bars, I'll tell you, if I fall off the monkey bars, Spartan makes me do burpees. (laughs) That's the penalty for falling. There's no nice person who comes and carries me across the monkey bars. They're like, nope, you failed that obstacle. Do burpees, right? Yeah. So uh, we're going to talk about seven. I love that you, Bob did the research on this. He sent me the list that he wanted to work from. And I love that I'm conditioning and training Bob, right? Because he sent me the seven lessons. He didn't send me five or 10. Uh, you know, what's funny is I, hold on, I originally had five. Of course you did. 
And I, I, yeah, I did. I, I knew you either had 10 and you cut them down or you had five and you had to go add some. Yeah. Uh, we've got Bob trained, right? The seven lessons learned from attempting to do hard things and failing. Brrr, lesson number one, Bob Stewart. Perseverance. <laughs> like, Amen. The idea that it, it's not just because I failed, it's not done. It could be. I could, you know, we Ben had we did an episode on good quitting and bad quitting at yep. some point way back, right? I don't know. Every once in a while, you are going to decide not to do that thing, but more often than not, when we fail in life, we're going to do it again. We're going to try a different. We're just going to persevere. And man, I, I, I probably one of the things that gets me the most fired up with my boy is when they quit something, right? Out of frustration, and yes. generally. It's because they don't experience enough frustration and be forced to persevere or push through it. And Bob, some of that's our fault, right? I'm not 100%. saying you're a parent. Right? So we snow pl- what did um, Sarah snow Blakely plow. called it? Snow plowing, right? We get all that out of their way so they don't have to face this these challenges that make them more resilient, make them have to learn perseverance to get through all of that. Um, or we're a helicopter parent, you know, another term that that's around a little bit where we just hover too much. Uh, they're not having to learn it. So sometimes it's our fault that they're not developing the resi- resilience and they're getting frustrated. There's a, um, gosh, who, well, I don't even know where I saw this recently. I saw recently, and Ben, maybe Ben shared a video with us. I think it was Ben. Yeah. He shared a video with, with a big group of our, of our leadership. And um, it talked, there's a specific part in the brain that when you quit at something, that part of your brain shrinks and when you persevere through it, that part of your brain gets larger. So you can actually, like your brain is being trained every time you decide to quit at something to, to make it easier to quit the next time. Mm. In, in, it's a fascinating video. I should, I, I'm going to dig it up and send it to you because I, I loved your take on it. it. Yeah. Um, it's that part of the brain that they talk about is, is actually associated with like the longevity of life. And like mm. it, you, your brain by quitting over your life literally gets to a place at the end of life where you're like, you know what? I'm done. I'm checking out. And like you could actually build that up. It could actually lead to longer life by being more resilient. And, so and Bob, that's a particular part of your brain. You're telling me that's why we have so many old men saying, get off my lawn because they're so stubborn and resilient that they just keep living forever. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Oh, just checking. So Bob and I will be around for a while. It sounds like. Um, Folks, yeah, perseverance, resilience. What can you put in front of you that's going to force you to keep pushing through and pushing on so that you can grow that part of your brain and you can learn that and it's only going to come from failing at attempting things again and again and again. I think like one of my biggest professional, our biggest failures, you know, we had this company active rain and we had this massive offer that went right to like the the 12th hour, right to the end. And and then it fell apart. And we're talking like life changing amounts of money and it fell apart. And that was hard. Like, I don't know. After that, I was like, I don't know, man, I don't know if I want to do this. I don't know. I want to build this next thing or work like, but doing it, like just saying, all right, we failed. That was a miserable. We were in a bad spot after that failed. But like the act of getting up that next day and going in and, and just continuing to grind. And, you know, 20 years later, we're in another position to be able or I don't know, 15 years later, we're in another position to be able to, to you know, building something awesome. But it, it's on the back of just continual failures, right? But getting up the next day and going, all right, what are we going to do now? Perseverance. Yeah, there's nothing worse, Bob. I'll get into the gym and I'll work out and I use tonal at home. Anybody who wants to know about it, just message me. I I use tonal at home and at the end of a workout, it tells me how much I lifted compared to the last time I did that workout. So like the one I did yesterday, I was down 6,000 pounds from the last time I had done that workout because I had had some time off. I'd had some injuries. My brain immediately said, "Just, just don't ever do this one again, right? But now I know, no, the resilient part of me is like, no, 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 no. You're down 6,000. Okay, next time can we get down to only down 5,000? So can we be up 1,000? Can we be up enough? And can we get back to where we were? Folks, you've got to have it to be able to succeed in the long run. And it only comes. I think that that's, can I, I'm going to jump out of order here because I'm just going to go to the next one. And I think what you just said is a really good kind of representation of this. But um, a lesson to be learned from trying to do hard things and failing is, is this perception of success and failure. 
Yes. Like failure challenges your perceptions of what is success and failure, right? Because like you said, I'm down 6,000. So now you're like, all right, look, I, I've experienced enough failure in my life to realize if I come at this, if, if my perception of this is, man, I got to get back to 6,000, right? I got to get that. I got to close that. No, you're, you're taking a different perception. You're like, all right, failed here. Let, let's just try to make it a thousand. Right? But that is a result of your, you know, a lifetime of failure, Chad, and learning from that and, and, and now having this perception that says, all right, that stunk. How do I get back? Right. Like what? And, and cause you're not looking at closing the whole 6,000. You might never even tried that. You might've said, I right. give up. I'm never going to get there. You just said, well, let me change the perception. A, a win tomorrow is to get back to, to minus 5,000. Right. Absolutely. You know, I just did a, uh, for those of you who know, I've got a, another podcast going achieve your apex. So feel free to check it out in the win, make give network. I just interviewed our friend, David nurse oh, for yeah. an episode of it. So, uh, David was talking about those two words, success and failure. He's blowing he, up, by the way. He's got tons of followers, way more followers than he had when we first ran into this guy, right? Because of us. Some of, right. his, some of the guys he, he coaches are like top tier NBA guys now. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, he had a nice NBA connection, right? And he's grown. And, and I, I do get the chance to speak with David quite regularly. Yet, one of the things he was talking about on the interview I just did with him and on, on that episode, which will be dropped, I don't know when, in relation to this one, he said he's taking those two words out of his vocabulary, Bob. Because when we have success, often what we tell ourselves is, I have achieved it. And we stop, right? I succeeded at this. And it becomes past tense. When we have failure, it's also a stop, right? I failed. So, of course, he's changed failure, as many of us have, to, like, learn, right? He says, I didn't fail at something, I just learned, right? Ben, ben Franklin, years ago, years ago, right, I didn't fail at making a light bulb. I learned 10,000 ways not to make the light bulb. Mm. But he's even changed the word success to momentum. So now when he achieves a success, what he's saying is he's creating momentum, because what happens when we have momentum, we want it to keep going and keep growing and keep all that stuff. If we can do hard things or attempt hard things and fail them, right? Fail again and again, we will change what success and failure looks like along the way, right? We will, I mentioned in a recent episode about our friend Drew running marathon. His first marathon, a success would have been finish it. But then we got working on his pace and all that stuff that a success became do a sub four and a half hour marathon, right? Success was no longer just finish it. That was, that was a gimme, right? Success and failure are going to change as you attempt hard things. You'll grow. You have to. Yeah. I mean, I, the key takeaway for my boys here, for my kids is success is not linear, Right. And so your perception that like, you're just going to do a, then B, then C, then D, and then you're going to, you're going to be successful. No, man, it's, it's a, then B, then back to a three times, then B again. And then you fail there. And then, right. It's, it's, it's not linear. And you get to jump to Q, right. And then yeah. you go, right. It's all over the place. You're absolutely right. All right, Bob, which one do you want to go to next? Let's do, um, a lesson to be learned from trying to do hard things and failing is, um, the ability to become self-reflective or to learn from your failures. All right. Tell I, us more. I, one of the reasons I love sports, like I'm a sports guy, Chad, I'm, I'm yeah. super excited. Recently, my boys have, I, I kind of tricked them. I got them the baseball cards and now they're like, one of them's full bore into sports, man. He's every single night we're talking about who was the best NBA, this, that, but, but my oldest boy, he's 16. And he's playing baseball at a pretty high level. He's a junior in high school. He's, he's starting for the varsity team at Seattle Prep here. And they're 0 and 7 right now. So their season started. They went down to a tournament in New Orleans and just got the snot kicked out of them. Um, they're 0 and 7. And I was having a conversation with him the other day. And I said, look, because he, he's, he's, you know, he's also one of these kids. He plays on like a, a, a travel team, right? And that, his travel team is better than his high school team. Okay. Just flat out, right? His, the kids on his travel team, they don't make errors at that shortstop. And the high school kids do. And so he, in, when he's pitching, he gets really frustrated by those, those failings behind him. And I'm like, look, Kellen Robert, this year is going to be a learning. There's going to be a lot of failure, man. You're going to learn a whole bunch this year. You're going to learn how to 
not hang your head when one of your teammates makes a mistake and make him feel even worse for that mistake. Like you're going to learn how to, you know, overcome the, the, the third out you guys should have had, but your guy made an error. And now you got a guy on first, second and third and, and you're pitching it. Like you're going to learn so much this year. And I want you to really like lean into that. Okay. Yeah. If you get frustrated because you guys end up you know, three and 20, like you're, you're going to miss a lot of opportunities this year. And, and so, I mean, anytime we fail is a chance for us to look back, reflect, and hopefully learn something from that. What could I do better there? What, what maybe could I have controlled? Um, Chad, I mean, I think, look, self-reflection is the foundation for all of our kind of development. Yes. Right? But, and Bob, but we've done we've done this before. I have a whole chapter on it in the book, right? I talk about strengths and weaknesses again and again, figuring out our strengths, figuring out our weaknesses. Too many people are out there are attempting to improve their weaknesses so that they can be overall better, right? It's the jack of all trades, master of none concept. Instead, we should be focusing on our strengths and leveraging away our weaknesses. We've talked about this. Self-reflection from attempting to do hard things and failing is going to help us realize what are our strengths? Where are our weaknesses? Right? What can I do? What can I not do? Where am I really strong that I should be focusing on this? And where am I running into a wall that it doesn't matter? I'm never going to get better at it. And even if I do, I'm still going to be pretty crappy at it. I'm just going to be better than I was and it's not worth the effort. So folks, attempting hard things and failing is going to help you start to learn your strengths, your weaknesses, uh, cause I learned, right. I rely on talking my way out of something because one of my strengths is talking, right? So I would learn when I failed things. Oh, I re- okay. I went this way. This is how I solved a lot of those problems. There was a strength. Here was a weakness. I procrastinated or I didn't this. Okay. So I learned to say, I got to figure out ways to leverage away that challenge. Self-reflection has helped me become who I am. I know it's who's helped you become who you are folks. Many of you have fallen into who you are without the reflection to get there. And if you start paying attention to the things you're attempting and failing, you'll figure out a lot more about yourself. All right. That's three of your seven, Bob. Is it? Next. All right. right, Next up. um, So again, the lessons to be learned from trying to do hard things and failing. And I think the the, let's start a lot of it's been focused on the fail, but in order to try to do hard things, you're probably going to be taking some risks. And this can, you know, this can up our ability to, to be comfortable taking risks. Because doing something hard, Chad, is generally going to require some amount of risk. And it could be as simple as like, the risk of, of looking foolish if you don't succeed, right? Yeah. Like, and the risk of hurting yourself if you don't, you know, if you fall off the monkey bars, the risk of, but it's, it's building up this muscle in us that's willing to take those risks that's willing to summon the courage when we're when we're maybe there's a little bit of fear there or um by the way this could be trying to do hard things and and succeeding as well but i think when we fail and then we try to do the hard thing again right we we build up our propensity to be willing to take risks yeah and, and we did a whole episode on overcoming fears recently right we don't know when dave drops these things yet recently we did one and, and what we said, and we said it on that one, people have heard it before, that failure teaches us courage isn't the absence of fear. It's the willingness to attempt something in spite of that, right? Knowing that, oh, I can still be fearful of jumping out of an airplane, yet courage is the thing that still tells me to jump because I have the parachute, right? And be able to do it. Courage is the thing that tells me that, yes, that could be dangerous, yet I know it's controllable enough that I can overcome that fear. Um, You tell your boys, and it was the movie um, I always think about, We Bought a Zoo, where he says you just need 20 seconds of, you know, insane courage or something like that. You always tell us, you tell your boys, right? It's on the other side of that feeling uh, are all the great things that are out there. And if they're not taking risks, they'll never develop courage, which is saying it's okay when I fail, it's not the end of the world, so I will develop courage for the next risk because I know it's not going to be the end of the world. Yeah, for How sure. How many entrepreneurs, Bob, and, and we got a lot of them here listening that qualify this, failed at one, two, three businesses along the way, right? My yeah, hands what up. They did, <laughs> right? You, you attempted hard things of building that business up to be the next Amazon, the next Facebook, the next whatever company, Walmart, whatever company you want to compare it to, right? 
and we failed. We didn't get it there. Yet it helped us to build up that risk-taking and courage you're mentioning for the next opportunity that put itself in front of us to say, hey, I ended up at rock bottom. I ended up with nothing. And I turned it all around and I've built a better person for it. What's the worst thing that can really happen? I go there again. I grow again from it. We develop this courage that comes. That's a great one that you have on your list. It's funny. I, I, this is a really ridiculous example but, uh, from my youth. I, uh, when I was in fifth grade, Chad, I, I ran for student body president. Oh, I thought this was going to be the Smokey the Bear coloring contest. No, no, thing. I, I did win a coloring contest. That was in first grade. But in fifth grade, I ran to be the student body president of Ridgewood Elementary School, right? Going into oh, the sixth grade year. And I lost by one vote. Oh. And it was devastating. And on the walk home after school, my brother was in third grade, but my brother was kind of a big third grader. A kid said, if I would have voted for you, you would have won. And my brother punched him in the face. But that's beside <laughs> the point. Uh, but here's what it, it – I, I could have decided – it was embarrassing. I lost, right? Nathan Conrad, you son of a gun. Um, and But it – I in in eighth grade – and it's, I actually credit to my, my mother. Um, she encouraged me to run again in eighth grade. And I was like, I don't want to do it. Like that sucked. I lost. I was embarrassed. And, but however, my mom helped me kind of summon the courage to go do it again. And, and I, I won the second time. Right. And I think what it, what it taught me was you can do it again. Right. Like, like, most people are when you fail at something miserably and it's public and it's humiliating are not going to try that thing again. Yes. And I probably wouldn't, right? Like as a as, as just the, the kid I was as a 13-year-old wasn't I didn't have any of these you know these lessons. My mom had them. She was able to 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 usher me along and and help me, you know, take the risk again and and summon the courage and get past the embarrassment. I, I could have lost again, by the way. Uh, Sarah Verona, though, I'd beat her. Um, anyway. It's interesting. I don't remember the names of the people who beat me. I did run for student council president. Another thing we have in common, I actually almost got expelled for it uh, because my friends who were the artists who made the posters made them very graphic in the sense like <laughs> I missed the chance to vote for Chad and the guy was like, you know, putting a yeah, violent, I won't get to it, uh, that the principal called me to the office on election day and made me uh, step out of the election and almost- I remember every vote. name of every person that's ever beat me. No, I can remember I, the names of all the kids as- in, in, in elementary and high school that were better than me at the sports I played. Like I remember every name. I, I can't remember anybody I beat, by the way, but everybody that beat me, I know them. Folks, I want you to hear in there. Bob remembers the names of everybody who beat him. He can't remember anybody he beat. Could that be- because Bob just lost a lot and there aren't any names to remember on the other side. All right, let's no, keep no, going. No. It's because it's a very limited number of names I need to remember on the beat me side, Chad. That's Got it. All right, we'll give you that credit there, Bob Stewart. All right, we've gotten four. Give me the fifth. Then I'll get to getting closer to that recap as you're attempting to remember which ones you've used and not used off your list. Adaptability and flexibility. It just, uh, failure it t- it teaches us to... Try it different next time, right? To be yeah. adaptable, to be flexible. Um, and, and look, a lot of times, by the way, whatever you're you're aspiring to do, it's not like you fail at the very end. It's like I do, I do, I do, and then I fail. It's most of the time in anything we're doing. There's like there's momentum, and what was what was his learning? Failure? There was there's momentum and learning all along the way, right? Yep. And so, just your ability to to react, to to change, to adapt, to be flexible. It's really a function, like w- when we get momentum, we're probably going to keep doing a lot of what we've been doing to get the momentum. But when we, when we, when we, lo- when we need to learn, we're going we're gonna to adapt and change and, and become a little bit more flexible. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Bob, the only thing I hear when you, when you brought this one up and put on the list was the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing again and again, expecting a different result. If you don't learn to be adaptable, if you don't learn flexibility, you're just insane. Enough said. Next on the list, humility and acceptance. I, this one to me is is especially watching like I've been watching a lot of baseball recently with Kellen, right? And watching these yeah. kids out there, and I, I love baseball. It's I didn't play a lot of baseball as a kid. I probably tapped out at you know seventh grade when I realized kids could throw really fast and right at your head. I was like, eh, not for me. I'm not doing this. But baseball is such a great sport for failure. But you fail. You know, if, if you if you're 
successful one out of three times, you're a hall of famer. <laughs> one <laughs> out of three. That's amazing. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's like a, that's a, that's just a, a massive career, right? If you hit three thirty three in major league. Baseball. So, I mean, you're failing three out of four times. Just yep. it, it's, there's so much failure and what it teaches you is humility. Oh yeah. You know, you, you, you're hard pressed to find a real, real, um, ego, out on a baseball field they're, they're far and few between right but mostly what you get in in that particular sport is a bunch of humility a oh, bunch yeah. of you're not that great right and it just reminds us that we can learn from those experiences we can get better it's not the end of the world it's, it's humbling and i think to, to good end chad you know, Bob, I'll take it out of the sports world. I'll take it into the business world because many of our people are like baseball. I don't play baseball. What are you talking about, Bob? Right. Okay. Yet salespeople, how many sales calls do you make a day that end up with a no? Right. Your percentage is probably very low when it comes to success rate. If you truly looked at it, even the most successful people have probably a very low success rate. They're probably converting a very few amount. Car salesman person doesn't convert everybody who comes into the lot every day, right? We're in that position where a lawyer doesn't win every case that comes. I'd actually probably be a little more concerned about the lawyer who did win every case, right? Because there isn't going to be the humility. There's going to be the, uh, you know, we're going to be on suits there and we've got, um, now I can't think of my, my main guy on suits, right? Not Mike. Harvey? Um, Harvey, thank you. I mean, we're all arrogant, right? It's, it's Harvey arrogance that comes along with, with all of that. You need some humility and it only comes. I mean, talent. I think that what humility really leads to is the willingness to go out and, and like embrace feedback, figure out what my DNA was on that failure and, and what could I improve next time to potentially not do the same thing. Um, it's pretty, okay, I, so pause, I, because I think you're segueing right into your seventh on your list perfectly. Let me recap first, and then we'll continue that conversation. So first, seven lessons to be learned from attempting to do hard things and failing. And if you notice, I can't say that other word with the T very often. I have trouble. I keep turning it into attempting. Yoda taught us, Bob, there is no try, right? Okay, do or okay. do not. All right. <laughs> So uh, the first you said was resilience and perseverance is going to be taught to us. Then we jumped down to what our perception is of success and failure. We kept going and we said one of the lessons would be self-reflection and learning. Another lesson is risk-taking and courage, adaptability and flexibility, humility and acceptance. And Bob, I think what you're talking about that you were just leading us to, you said it allows us to seek out feedback, learn from our experience and grow. And the best place to do that is your seventh level or your seventh lesson, which is developing a resilient network and really strong support system for us. So we have those people there when we fail that are going to pick us back up. Absolutely. I, it, I think of um, Ben often tells the story of a, a guy in our world, Anthony Zapata. And today, Anthony Zapata is one of the top listing agents in the United States. This guy is a master on the phones. He's his, his ability to set a, an appointment, which is kind of the, the, it, are just like un, unmatched. He, but in the beginning he stunk and Ben's right. like, this guy would make, you know, a thousand phone calls and he'd talk to, to 200 people and he, he'd get nothing out of it. And he would just, just failure after failure, after butchered script delivered after, um, but he had Ben to go back to, right? He, he had somebody, he had a couple somebodies, but he had people to go back to and go, Hey, can I practice my scripts with you? Hey, I thought I had that person on the phone and man, I just didn't ask the right question to get to, to close her. Like he had this, this, network of people to go back to and and to to learn from essentially yeah bob I mean, and you've got to have that res that network and support system because when you fail the challenge is a lot of times we then think well we're a failure yet bob you might fail at what you were attempting to do today yet you're still a success as a husband you're still a success as a father. You're still a success as a friend. You're still a success as a son. You're still a success at this and a success at that. You just failed at that thing. And if we have a strong support system around us, we can be reminded of that. 
right? Which will then help us build resilience and say, oh, wait a minute, and allow us to have some more adaptability and allow some of that humility to come in and say, you're right, I did fail at this, yet boy, thanks to you people reminding me I am a success at this. Uh, this takes a, the, like, the, look, a lot of us don't, like, in Anthony's case, he kind of, he, he was brought into an organization where this this support system existed. Some of us have to go we have to humble ourselves and go ask for that support from somebody, Chad, right? Like a lot of us don't have just a built-in Ben Kinney sitting in the room with us, but many of us have access to people that could help us if we were humble enough to, to be willing to share our story of failure and, and, you know, look for their guidance on how they got to where we're going. Like in almost any profession, any, in your marriage, you could look around and find somebody that has the marriage that, that you but again, you'd probably have to humble yourself and go to him and say, hey, I'm struggling in my marriage right now, right? Like, I, I look to you as somebody that's a really good example of what a great marriage could be. Like, would you be willing to be a part of my network that I could tap into to ask for advice about how to be a better husband, right? Like, that, yeah. there's a lot of humility that comes with building up a really good support system around you, potentially, right, for most of us. So, folks, we're going to challenge you to do hard things or at least attempt them. Now, could that be something like running one of my my favorite Spartan races or a marathon that we've talked about? Could that be about sitting down and making a thousand sales calls tomorrow? Could that be about strengthening a relationship at home? Could that be about taking a risk to a new venture that you're looking to jump into? You got to take the moment to attempt hard things. Otherwise, you look up and you're soft when you really need it the most. It won't be there for you. Folks, this is an episode to share with someone as we continue our journey to expand the Win, Make, Give network. And we're looking to you as a regular listener to bring a friend along for the journey, someone who maybe needs to attempt to do hard things. Let us be the one to give them the lessons along the way. Until our next episode, as always, say it with me, audience. Do, do good. good.